Darkness reigns all around me. I am walking through a large forest on a narrow, treacherous path. Large trees surround me tightly on all sides. I am walking home, but I feel that there are sinister ghosts lurking behind the trees, waiting for me to step off the path. There is no moon, but I know the path. I've walked this path hundreds of times. I emerge into a meadow. It is lit with a silvery gray light. I look up. The sky is covered with a dense blanket of stars. It is their light that I see in the meadow. Suddenly a figure appears and runs. As it approaches, I see that it is a young woman, almost a girl. She is concealed by a long hooded cloak. When she pulls back the hood, she reveals her hair. It is as black as a raven's wing, darker than night. On her oval face are two flawless green eyes, wide open in fright. They blaze like the reflection of fire and ice. I know her. Edward, she pleads, help me, they're coming. Please, Edward, I'm the last of the witches, they're coming. I nod and go to hug her. There is a blinding flash of bright light. My wife, Lucy, has pulled back the bedroom curtains. The morning sun reflects even more brightly off the freshly fallen snow. The flakes began falling before midnight. By morning, a late winter storm had dumped a foot of snow. Oh, please, I grumbled. Don't wallow, she commanded. Remember I'm leaving for Miami today. She stared out the window at the accumulating snow, but then she turned and saw me. Oh, you're shivering. I was lying on the bed, pulling back the covers. The room was cool, but I could feel that the sheet was damp with my sweat. Is it that nightmare again? she asked. Yes, but this time it went farther. It spoke to me. And what did the raven-haired woman say? I can't remember. Something about witches. I'd been having these nightmares for about a year now, ever since we'd built the new house on Osborne Road that I'd inherited from my family. Figures. It's a nightmare, witches and goblins. But you've got to get up because I've got to get to the office. You need to shovel the driveway. I had a lot of work to do. Fortunately, my wife's Christmas present was a new supercharged snowblower. When I finished shoveling the driveway to the road, I followed the drainage channel to the walkway so that Esmeralda Wolcott would have an exit if she needed one. Esmeralda lives across the road from us in the oldest house in Hollybrook. It's called Blackthorn Cottage. It's a misnamed 10,000-square-foot structure. Her house was built over centuries, adding one room after another as needed. The land I inherited from my family ends right at the border of Esmeralda's property. We built our modern house by the old woods that my wife Lucy fell in love with, right off the lane so that we wouldn't have to spend money paving a new road. Our modern structure is just over a hundred feet from the front door of Esmeralda's sprawling house. As my snowplow's engine hissed to a halt, Esmeralda opened the door. That's very kind of you, Edward, she said. The least a neighbor could do, I replied. Osborne Road is just outside the limits of Hollybrook Township. It's six miles to the town center, and there are only a few houses on the road. As luck would have it, our house and Esmeralda's house were only a few hundred feet up the little street, just where Osborne joins the county highway. The county plows had been working all night. My wife would have no trouble getting to her office and then to Logan Airport in Boston. Come in for a hot chocolate, Esmeralda invited. I accepted her invitation as it would have been rude to refuse. Esmeralda is a woman of considerable age. I have lived in Hollybrook all my life except for my school years. Even as a young boy, I remember Esmeralda as an old woman. She is a permanent part of the Hollybrook landscape. Her home reflects her heritage. At its center is an old salt box that expands on all sides until the original one-room dwelling is the largest on Osborne Road. The center of the house is one large square room with a massive hearth against the back wall. It is a modest room of rough pine planking with a ceiling of round, bare beams. Its modest furnishings would be considered valuable antiques today. The dominant feature of the room, however, is the fireplace. It is tall and wide enough for several people to enter at once. It is made of shiny black stone and decorated with hand carvings of a quality that is no longer found in our automated world. A special motif is the Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail, surrounded by two feathered wings with a baby in a fetal position in the center of the circle. Legend has it that my family, the Good Sons, lived in Thorn Cottage in colonial times, all in one room. Esmeralda, however, has inhabited the place for as long as anyone can remember. 
The center room is the large entrance hall from which the entire house branches off. Esmeralda led me into a small sunroom in the far left corner. It is the smallest and most modern room in the house. Large double glass doors connect to Esmeralda's greenhouse. A little bit of spring under glass in a snowy winter. Esmeralda brought cocoa and cookies on a tray, which she placed on a small table between two wicker chairs. Edward, please sit with me and chat for a while, she invited. Okay, but I can't stay long. Lucy is leaving on business in Miami today. Don't worry, I won't keep you. Just long enough for you to warm up. She said it with a slightly mischievous note in her voice. She always called me Edward, not Ed or Eddie, and I always said Esmeralda, not Essie or Rila as they called her around town. She was known for her sense of humor and open personality. The local clergy didn't like her views on women's rights. She was a major patron of the Women's Health Center and financially supported our local family planning center. I must say the plants in your greenhouse are pleasing to the eye on this snowy day, I praised. Yes, they are nice, but keeping them blooming is a hassle. Still, we need them, don't we? She said and paused, gazing into the compact glass structure. My oleander has had a particularly hard time this winter, but the mandrake, geraniums, mint, and sage are doing just fine. It was very nice of the Larch brothers to build a greenhouse for you, I thought. The Larch twins, Leonard and Chucks, were two of the ugliest guys in Hollybrook, but the ladies seemed to have a liking for them. They were especially friendly with Esmeralda. Oh, you know, I have a sort of barter with them, Esmeralda said with a wink. But tell me about your family. Is Lucy traveling? The poor thing can't stay at home. I hope you are well. I assured her that everything was fine in our home and kept my doubts to myself. A better wife than Lucy Richards, who for the last seven years had been Mrs. Edward Goodson, could not have been desired. It wasn't just that my Lucy was a beautiful woman, much more beautiful than one would expect from an average guy like me. She was a loving and attentive mother and wife when she was home. She ran her own business, a financial management firm called Peabody, Goodson & Myers, also known as PGM Partners. Now that Silas Peabody has retired, Lucy was managing partner. Lucy travels a lot, Esmeralda interjected into my thoughts. Yes, but that's the nature of the business. They manage retirement plans for small firms all over the East Coast. Meeting with clients and beneficiaries involves a lot of traveling, I said, suppressing the image in my mind of what I had found in her travel suitcase before her last trip. I hope she's not neglecting you, Esmeralda said. No, you can't blame Lucy for that. She keeps all the balls in the air and drops none. A truer statement I never met with. I couldn't claim neglect. When we were first married, my wife was incredible in the bedroom, and with the exception of the period before the birth of our twin daughters. Well, I don't see how a woman can run the house and work full-time herself, Esmeralda was perplexed. Esmeralda's thoughts were in the kitchen, and mine were in the bedroom, but I deftly brushed off her question now because Lucy was the primary earner, and I ran the house and dealt mostly with the children. Our girls were my greatest burden and my greatest joy. As for the children, I suspect they fell into the difficult category. Certainly my wife couldn't handle them, but I could achieve instant obedience. It only helped if I was in close proximity. Because of this, I was housebound and appreciated my flexible employment. Turning to Esmeralda, I laughed and said, You know we don't maintain a perfect home. That would be difficult with two five-year-olds in the house. Nonsense, your house is beautiful and no one expects it to be perfect. You just have to do a good job, she objected, adding. Living in this old house, I can't judge others. Now it was my turn to protest. Esmeralda, you know very well that your house is the most delightful in Hollybrook. Certainly the oldest extant, she said, but not the most delightful. Only this room is truly comfortable and modern. I built it for a man who loves light and nature, she said in a low and wistful tone. Often Esmeralda seemed to drift away to another time and place. I did not question her about for whom she had built the room. I always suspected that Esmeralda held a torch for a lost love. As my mother used to say, in old age, loss is the surest companion. Well, I have to go, I declared. I have a lot to do today. Yes, you are a very busy and hardworking man. In fact, you always have been. Arriving home, I found my two daughters excited. There would be no school on this snowy day, 
and my two little devils intended to take full advantage of it. They had already sent our cat Belzebub into hiding. I'll have to lure him out for his morning feeding. The cat showed up about three years ago, around the time the shape of my marriage and life changed. After our daughters were born, Lucy withdrew for a long time but then returned to work. This happened at my initiative. It made sense. At the time, I was teaching part-time at the local community college. We could use the money, and I had the time to provide the childcare and patience with our daughters that my wife lacked. Lucy's return to work was a good move for us, and not just financially. A few months after she started working, our sex life returned. It happened practically overnight. From zero to 180 nothing, and almost to the point where we had to fight her off. I've heard other husbands complain about having to pursue sex. In my case, I need a day off. Lucy's trips give me a break. That was until the doubt started to set in. At first, it was nothing more than an uneasy feeling that I was missing something. Perhaps it was just a mistrust of luck. We New Englanders expect hard times. We are suspicious of the easy life, and we may well assume that disaster awaits us around the next corner, with the devil lurking in the shadows. I had no reason to suspect my wife. As time went on, her traveling increased, but so did her business. Her work had always involved travel. Her remaining partner, Todd Myers, was a wheelchair-bound accountant with a passion for high technology. Lucy found new clients and delighted old ones. Since Silas Peabody retired, she has been managing investment strategies. Despite her busy work schedule, she was always there for me. She was never irritable or short with me. I thought she was strict with the girls, but then she tried to be disciplined. Dad, the mild-mannered one, did better with the stubborn twins. There were times I saw my wife tired and haggard, but she always smiled and hugged me. Returning late after a long day of work, she would help me put our girls to bed, ignoring their requests for another bedtime story. It's bedtime for the young ladies, she scolded, and the old ones too, she added with a wink. In private, she would ask, how is the best man in New England? She pressed her tired body against mine for a hug. What can his exhausted wife do for him? She would ask with a sly smile and rub my crotch with her foot. We would head to bed, even though I knew she only wanted to sleep. Sleep would have to wait until she got rid of the arousal she so easily instilled in me. No, my life was perfect, so it was no wonder my puritanical soul was suspicious. It could only continue as a vague apprehension, but the devil came to tempt me with the lost bag. Six weeks passed before that snowy morning during my winter vacation. I was now a full-time tenured professor. I was beginning to relax and feel confident. My wife went to New York for New Year's Eve. It was a longer-than-usual trip right after Christmas. She took the New York-Boston flight from Logan Airport, since Amtrak trains did not run between the two cities. Lucy usually took a carry-on, but a longer trip required a larger bag. She took my rarely used garment bag. Lucy arrived home without a bag. An overzealous agent at the New York boarding gate demanded to check the bag. Two days later, alone at home because my daughters were at school and Lucy was back in her Medford office, I opened the door to a private courier firm that returned the lost bag on behalf of Delta Airlines. I hung the bag on the hallway closet door. There was no reason to search that bag. That would be an invasion of my wife's privacy and for no reason at all. Surely it should only contain dirty clothes that needed to be washed or a business suit in need of dry cleaning. Throughout the morning, I passed the bag several times and began to argue with myself. It was my bag, wasn't it? Lucy had borrowed my bag. Why shouldn't I look in it? But that would be wrong. In the end, I decided that if I didn't find anything, and I would, I'd feel better. It was almost time to take the girls to the school bus when I gave in to my doubts and searched the bag. Placing it on the dining room table, I unzipped the main compartment. If I expected to see a business suit, I was wrong. There lay a green evening dress that looked expensive, and remarkably, I had never seen it before. I told myself that the dress proved nothing. So there was a holiday party for business associates. After all, she was going away for New Year's Eve. But she hadn't said anything about a party, or even an evening out. At the bottom of her bag was a pair of green stiletto-heeled shoes that matched the color of her dress. Five-inch heels say a lot, except what do they say? My wife is five feet ten inches. I'm just under six feet. She would never wear shoes like that when she was on a date with me. I should have stopped there, but I went on as if some irresistible force was driving me. Flipping the bag over, I looked at her dirty underwear in the deep back pocket. Another surprise or a whole series of them. 
very expensive things she didn't wear in our house, and finally, in the depths of the bag, a piece of silver white silk. A teddy of a type I had never seen on my wife, but someone had worn this one. It was stained in the crotch with something. I didn't want to think what it was. I heard the sound of a car pulling up. Someone was coming. I rushed to gather everything back into my bag. No sooner had I reached the closet than I heard the front door open, so I threw the bag over the back of a dining room chair and rushed into the kitchen. Lucy came in. I heard her looking around, first in the hallway, then in the living room, and finally in the dining room where she found the bag. I grabbed a potato from the cupboard and was washing it in the sink when she walked into the kitchen. I see my husband is working hard, she said to my back. I tried to comprehend what I had found. I knew I had to keep it a secret for now. I had nothing definite, and my discernment was flawed. However, my doubts were growing into certainty. I had to look her in the face. I turned and said, You're home early. Did something happen? Oh no, I just missed my husband, she replied, coming over and hugging me. Then, ever so nonchalantly, she added, I see they found the missing bag. She said it like it was a surprise, and then it hit me. The shipping firm notifies the airline that the bag has been returned. The airline then notifies the passenger. When Lucy got that notice, she rushed home. More proof of guilt. But I didn't say anything. I really miss you when I'm gone, she said, bestowing a deep and passionate kiss on me. I knew where she was going with this, but I wasn't sure I could go there with her right now. Thinking quickly, I said, your daughters will be home from school any minute. Thankfully, just as I finished speaking, the school bus horn sounded and I got out to pick up our girls. That was six weeks ago, and today Lucy is leaving for Miami. However, I now had a plan, and in the next few days, everything would be resolved one way or another. Doubt was eating away at me like a cancerous tumor. I had suspicions, but no actual proof. Of course, my wife hadn't been completely honest with me. Still, it's a big step from having the wrong type of clothes in her bag to being accused of infidelity. Such an accusation requires proof. I told myself that ignorance was worse than the hard truth. I had to do something. I decided to find out what happened when she wasn't home. Her next trip was to Miami. It's a big city full of diverse and fickle people. It's easiest to hide in a general crowd of strangers. I decided the best alternative was to follow her to Miami and see if I could get a glimpse of what she was doing, if anything at all. I had almost six weeks to plan between Lucy's trips. I decided to follow up on her Miami trip and started planning for her one step later. This presented some challenges. Lucy, a professional financial manager, handled all of our finances. I had access to bank accounts and credit cards, but they were all joint. I couldn't take a trip without her knowledge. The first thing I did was set up secret accounts in my name only. I planned to keep tabs on her for as long as possible while she was in Miami. It wouldn't be easy, and I might be discovered before I knew anything. However, I had to do something about it, if only to assuage my doubts. I needed to take time off work and find a plausible excuse to leave the girls with their grandparents, Lucy's parents. I planned to be gone for only three days, from the day after Lucy left until the day she returned from her trip Monday through Friday. There was no problem with work. I had a wonderful department chair, and we agreed to reschedule some of my classes and have him teach some of them. Things came to a head when I learned that Boston College was recruiting for a position in my area of expertise, history after the Civil War, from Reconstruction to the Spanish-American War. I had no chance at the position, but since I was a full professor, they would certainly give me a pro forma interview. Lucy didn't know much about the academic profession. I was confident that I could turn the interview process into a three-day affair. When I told her about the job opening, she was enthusiastic. That's good, she said. You've been so depressed lately. You need a change. I hadn't realized I was out of sorts. I tried to keep my spirits upbeat, but something must have made itself felt. We had a long discussion about the pros and cons of a job I would never get. We could commute to work together, she suggested. Chestnut Hill is a long way from Medford. I've been thinking about moving the office closer to Boston, she replied. It would take longer and we'd need more childcare for our twins. Or we could move, she suggested. Is that what you want to do? Move to the suburbs or even the city, I asked. I thought you liked living in the country. For a long time, as her business grew, 
I wondered if she felt constrained by backward Hollybrook. The industry here is college and tourism. Did Lucy want to go to the city? She answered my question with a smile. I want my husband to be happy. Country or city, it doesn't matter. Just as long as we are together. I realized what is important. Conventions, people's opinions, business success, and location don't matter. Our happy family is what is most important. After that speech, I felt like a complete fraud in what I had planned. I was about to cancel the trip, but I remembered the contents of that travel bag. I was more aware than ever that something was going on with Mrs. Edward Goodson, the former Lucy Richards. At any rate, I had an excuse for the three-day absence. Now I needed a plane ticket and my wife's itinerary to Miami. The first wasn't difficult. Boston to Florida is a great route. It's busy, but with a great selection of airlines. The other was my wife's route. My mother-in-law is Patricia Richards, wife of Judge John Richards, a retired appellate court judge. He is 15 years older than his wife. When we first met, Mrs. Richards looked at me with suspicion. She was nee Patricia Fitzsimmons, the youngest daughter of a Boston Irish clan she had shocked by marrying the son of a Boston Brahmin family. At the time, Patty was 17 and John was already an established corporate lawyer. The scandalous marriage delayed John's assertion in the dock for several years. Patty, as she was popularly known, was a socialite in Cambridge, where she chose to raise her children, my wife and her two older siblings, Beth, after Patty's mother, Elizabeth and Thomas, after John's father. Lucinda, my Lucy, named after John's mother, was the youngest and the clear favorite of everyone in the family. I understood why Patty had taken a cool attitude toward me when Lucy first brought me to meet the family. I was a part-time teacher at a two-year school. Lucy was an extraordinary beauty and an MBA from Harvard. It was only natural that a mother would hope for something more for her beloved daughter. Over the years, however, my relationship with my mother-in-law changed. She gradually warmed to me as it became apparent that Lucy and I were immensely happy and that I was fully supportive of my wife's career. The birth of our identical twin daughters, named Pat after her and Sarah after my mother, moved us from being just relatives to being friends. Patty became my counselor for all things related to childcare and mothers suffering from depression after childbirth. Women get depressed after childbirth. It's somewhat normal and only in some cases serious, Patty advised me. But as Lucy's blue mood continued, Patty held my hand and helped me as best she could. The first 18 months after giving birth were the hardest, but then Lucy went back to work full time, and overnight there was a miraculous change. I will never forget how Patty helped me through that time. Patty is the kind of person who organizes everything. Since she would be picking up our daughters while I was away, I involved her in the planning, knowing that she would know Lucy's schedule and mine. With my schedule, it was easy. I had a friend who worked as an assistant basketball coach at Boston College. It was that time of year when teams were often on the road. Larry was out of town, but he insisted I use his apartment, which was vacant. I'll leave the key under the mat by the back door, he told me. I'm glad you're interviewing for the position. I thought of you when I heard they were looking for someone for reconstruction. Larry and I met at a seminar at Gettysburg College. Larry was an African-American, a Civil War enthusiast, and I was the speaker on General Longstreet in the years after the Civil War. Longstreet was one of the few Southerners who took his oath of office to the United States seriously after the Civil War, and for that he was generally hated by Southerners. Thank you, Larry. I've scheduled my interview for Tuesday morning, but if anyone asks, I'll stay with you until Thursday. I'd had lunch with Patty the week before Lucy's trip. If she suspected any deception on my part, she didn't give any sign of it. I'm looking forward to my granddaughters coming to Cambridge, she told me. Well, they'll probably stay with you for three whole days. I'll drop them off early Tuesday morning, I told Patty. That's not a problem. You deserve time to focus on your career. My daughter spends enough time away from home. She leaves Monday afternoon on a Delta flight and returns late Friday morning, Patty replied. It's not that hard, she continued. My daughter schedules a lot of free time. Late morning meetings and things to do by three, and Thursday looks especially clear. Well, you know she's probably keeping her options open in case an opportunity comes up or something goes wrong. That's what I like about my son-in-law. He's always on my daughter's side. And whose side should I be on? Well, hopefully on hers and your own. 
I always thought they were the same. We had lunch at a nice little coffee and tea style restaurant in Medford. We had invited my wife to join us, but I had warned her very late and she was busy. As casually as possible, I said, Knowing my wife, it's hard to believe she ever had a free schedule. I got what I hoped for. Patty recorded Lucy's schedule on her phone and sent it to mine for me to look at. I looked it over quickly and said, You know, neither of us probably knows enough to judge how busy she's going to be. You're probably right, Patty acknowledged, and we moved on to discussing my daughter's proposed stay with Patty. Will John be helping out? I asked. A little, and that's more than he's ever helped his own children, she joked. Oh, stop it. My father-in-law isn't that bad, I objected. I liked my father-in-law. He was a deep thinker and lost in his own thoughts most of the time, but he was a nice, unassuming man. Yes, you're right, Patty admitted. John helped to the best of his ability. Of course, he was more involved with our children than my parents were, but that wasn't my father's fault. He worked very hard to pay the bills and spent all the time he could with us. My mother was very different. I knew the story, or rather, Elizabeth Fitzsimmons' story. Yes, her husband worked hard at the family real estate firm, but her success was primarily the result of his wife's work. Fitzy, that's what they called her, was an extraordinary beauty, and she knew it and took advantage of it. Rumors swirled around her, but no one dared to speak of it publicly. However, Fitzsimmons' firm was known for getting contracts from influential and connected people in Boston. Patty suddenly became a little melancholy and said in surprise, When I first met you, I knew that my youngest daughter intended to marry you, and I was afraid. Of me, Pat? No to her, she answered with a sad smile. She is the spitting image of my mother, and I was afraid you would not be able to keep the marriage going. But you proved me wrong, and my daughter has exceeded my expectations. She is a wife, mother, and businesswoman to be proud of. After that lunch, I felt ashamed and nervous. I had gotten what I wanted, but the only way out for me was for my wife to stay in Florida. However, I didn't know not only about my wife, but also about myself, and I had no idea what unnatural force was at work. The worst week of my life began with a snowstorm. When I woke up on Monday, I saw that I had snow to shovel. I suppose I had every excuse to neglect shoveling the driveway in Esmeralda's walkway. Still, I couldn't find it in me to leave the old woman in her maze. Lucy left well before noon. She had an afternoon flight to Florida, but had some office work to do first. I spent the day packing myself and the girls for the trip. I needed to get them dressed by 7 and on the road to Grandma's. The interview in Chestnut Hill was scheduled for 8.30 a.m., and the flight out of Logan was scheduled for 11.30. I decided that my preliminary interview would take no more than half an hour. I would have plenty of time to catch my flight, even with the heavy airport traffic and long lines at security. Monday night I put the girls to bed early. I went to pick them up after waiting for my wife's obligatory phone call. She calls every night when she's not home, telling me how much she loves and misses me. I used to believe her without question, but now my doubts gnaw at me. The first night she always told me about her trip. That night I heard the water splashing in the background. Where are you? I asked. I'm in the hotel pool, just relaxing. I have a big day tomorrow. Don't be mad that I escaped the snow and cold. Not mad, I replied, just curious. It was the Brickle Hotel, frequented by business travelers. Nevertheless, it had excellent amenities, including what their website indicated was a romantic rooftop pool with a bar. Well, don't stay up late if you have a big day tomorrow, I said, remembering her mother's opinion of her easy schedule. And I have a big day too. So I'd better go to bed. You're right. I shouldn't keep you up, she said. I just called to say I arrived safely and I love you. I knew she was expecting an answering, love you, but I hesitated for a moment before saying, I love you. I realized she caught that hesitation because she paused before saying, good night and good luck tomorrow, my love, and hung up. The last words were spoken softly, and I thought I might have caught the tremor in her voice. Setting my alarm clock for six in the morning, I rolled around in bed for a while before falling asleep. Sleep came again, and I found myself on a narrow path in the woods. I realized I was holding a small lantern in my hand. It was made of some kind of metal, very light in weight and badly tarnished. The front of the lantern was barely open, 
letting out only a narrow beam of light to guide my feet. Upon reaching the clearing, I closed the lantern so as not to give away my position. I realized I had been waiting for the girl to appear. She had appeared. She appeared on my left, on the run, and threw herself into my arms, begging me to hide her. The others are dead. Edward, help me. I felt the pain of loss and deep sadness. I put my arms around the girl and we crossed the meadow. I could hear voices in the woods behind us and to our left. We reached a small bridge that crossed a small stream. On the other side of the stream stood a small stone building sheltered by a ring of huge oak trees. I walked to the door and pushed it open with my shoulder. In one hand I held the girl, in the other a lantern. I let go of the girl and she stepped into the building. I opened the lantern and the dim light illuminated one large room. There was little furniture in the room, but a large loom stood to one side. Piles of material were stacked against the outer wall. The back wall was occupied by a massive fireplace, large enough to walk into. Where had I seen it before? The floor and walls were roughly chipped wood. The windows were narrow slits, shuttered against the night. I closed the door and slid the deadbolt into place. Taking a candle from the lantern, I held it to a small pile of kindling in one corner of the large fireplace. The fire flared up, and I placed a small log on it. Having lighted the fire, I turned to the girl. She had taken off her cloak, and her black hair shimmered in the firelight. Her green eyes blazed with an inner fire. No one could doubt that she was a witch. Just as I thought about it, there was a knock on the door. She jumped into my arms as if some invisible force had pushed her in. The alarm clock rang, and I woke up. I was covered in sweat, and my heart was racing. I told myself it was just a dream but each time I saw it, it became more and more real. I wasn't just seeing it in my imagination. I could feel it with my soul. His grief, his fear, and above it all, there was something greater. Something that overwhelmed the senses. I pushed the dream out of my mind and forced myself to think about the present reality. I had prepared myself. I didn't change my clothes for the interview. To the white shirt and khaki pants I usually taught in, I added a sports jacket and tie. In Florida, I plan to change into beachwear, a sun hat, and dark sunglasses. That's an outfit my wife had never seen a guy from New England in. Hopefully, this would allow me to disguise myself enough to watch her from a distance. The mother-in-law was already up and ready to receive the kids. I fed them breakfast cereal, but Patty had hot cinnamon rolls waiting for them. I warned Patty not to feed the kids anything too sweet, but I knew a grandmother determined to spoil her granddaughters wouldn't say anything. After drinking the coffee Patty had slipped me, I headed for Chestnut Hill. I had plenty of time and took a ride around campus. It was the act of a small fish caught in a big pond. Boston College is often confused with Boston University, a much larger institution in Boston. The college was located outside the city and was a Jesuit institution affiliated with the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, it was much larger and more prestigious than the small community of Hollybrook so I looked longingly at it before heading to the administration building for my interview. I expected a short interview with an overworked junior staff member, but I was ushered into a well-furnished conference room where a three-person panel awaited me. There were two well-dressed young, dark-skinned women and an older man of obvious Asian descent, although he introduced himself as Peter Sargent. He was an administrator from Human Resources and Assistant Deputy, something like that in title. One woman, Martha Corey, was a history professor. A tall, thin woman with a warm smile, her clothes and African-American hairstyle suited her well. The other woman was an assistant professor of African diaspora studies, a new way of putting it, I thought, named Alice Parker. She was much shorter in stature, with a helmet of straight black hair and straight manners. When I sat down, I relaxed. At first, I was wary of the format, but from the composition of the panel, I assumed, wrongly as I soon found out, that the school was recruiting for diversity. Perhaps they were interviewing based on some misguided notion of racial balance. I was quickly disabused of this relaxed viewpoint. The interview didn't really matter. They simply knew too much about me. Peter, the bureaucrat, quickly and very efficiently checked my qualifications and gave me an extensive formal application form, which he wanted to receive no later than the following week. But really as soon as possible, he told me. As soon as the administrator fell silent, the female academics started talking. They wanted to talk about my only published work, a biography of James Longstreet after the Civil War. Why Longstreet specifically? demanded the tall professor. I admire him. 
He was a man of his word, I replied without hesitation. He was a Confederate general, insisted the tall woman. But you won't find a single statue to him in the South, and there are few monuments to him at all. When he swore allegiance to the United States after the war, he never once broke his oath. Name another CSA general with such a record of post-war service to the country. The short woman smiled, then attacked. Your former students say you don't believe Reconstruction was a failure, she accused. Former students? I interjected. Yes, there were several in my classes this year and last year, my short inquisitor said with a smile. They were quick to inform me that I was wrong to call Reconstruction a failure when it was barely implemented before it was canceled. Hollybrook is a small two-year school, but we send a higher percentage of our graduates to four-year schools than most others. I've forgotten about all the letters of recommendation I've written for Boston College over the years. It's nice for a teacher to know that his or her students were listening. I couldn't help but smile, and both women smiled back. After that, the interview became pleasant but rather personal. As I was told, you have two young daughters, Alice began. Would your position here prevent you from caring for the children? What Alice meant, Martha interjected, was that since you are so close to your daughters and provide much of their daily care, would a position here interfere with your ability to care for them? They didn't give me a chance to answer, but began suggesting ways around the problem. Sure, I could move. Or you could put Sarah and Patricia in the day school here and work out a schedule of classes to accommodate your parenting needs. I'm sure his wife would help too, Peter said, stepping into the conversation. Both women frowned as if his suggestion was unhelpful. I had expected the interview to last half an hour, but it was 10 o'clock and there was no end in sight, and my plane was due to leave at 11.30. I was saved by Peter. That was very productive, he said. But we have other interviews, and my staff have texted me that one person is already waiting. Oh, that's okay, I understand, I said, trying not to show relief. But before I could get up, the women insisted that I be signed up for a second interview. Are you coming back? A shorter woman asked seductively. I was just about to arrange that, Peter informed us. Both women insisted on walking me out, and as I reached the door, Alice took my hand firmly and said, Now say hello to Essa and tell her we hope to see her again. I nodded my head in appreciation of her request and understanding of how she got her insider knowledge of my personal life. Still, a warning bell sounded in my brain. I was far behind schedule, but there was no need to worry. Miraculously, there were no delays between Chestnut Hill and Logan Airport. Forty minutes later, I was on the ground and boarding the plane. No traffic, a parking spot right at the garage entrance, and no crowd at the security check? It was as if a secret hand had swept all obstacles out of my way. On the plane, I had time to try to make sense of the interview. They knew Esmeralda. It was the only thing that made sense. She must have told them about me. That's how they knew my daughter's names and how close I was to them. It seemed to be a personal connection, and maybe I was actually being considered for the job. It was a good feeling, even though I had no hope of being hired. The flight was three and a half hours long, and I fell asleep after an hour, still thinking about the interview. And then sleep returned. The plane arrived early, and I was at the hotel a little after 4 p.m., I checked in but didn't go to my room. The hotel lobby had a large coffee bar located in the center of the hotel. I took a seat at the far end, away from the entrance and elevators. A little before five, my wife showed up. I discreetly followed her to the elevators. Far enough behind to watch heads turn to watch her pass. I saw her enter the elevator, and she was alone. The elevator stopped on the second floor and I took the stairs. Carefully opening the door on the second floor, I was too late. The corridor was clear in both directions. Lucy liked to book rooms on the lower floors. Being a practical businesswoman, she traded the view from the upper floors for ease of access. Thus, I was faced with the problem of identifying her room. I pondered over it as I made my way back down to the lobby. Grabbing my bag, I headed to my room on the sixth floor. As soon as I opened my room door, I already knew the answer to my problem. I quickly changed into casual clothes for the warm weather, put on dark glasses, and a cap. Walking down the stairs to the lobby, I found a small flower store. The woman in it was very kind. I want to send flowers to a hotel guest, I told her. You want them delivered? Yes, I said. 
I'm going away, but I want to leave a gift. Oh, I see. We settled on an expressive bouquet of white and blue flowers. When do you want them delivered and to whom? She asked. Right now to Lucinda Goodson, I informed her. Oh, we've delivered flowers to her before. The order came from somewhere else, but I fulfilled it, she informed me proudly. A big order? I asked carelessly. Well, let's just say very generous, she said with a smile. I headed for the main door of the hotel, but quickly turned to the elevators and waited. On the due date, the bouquet was delivered. I followed the delivery into the elevator and went up to the second floor. On the second floor, the young man carrying the flowers stopped at the third door on the right and knocked. While he knocked, I slipped out onto the landing and watched my wife open the door to accept the flowers. Now that I knew which room was hers, I returned to my seat at the coffee bar in the lobby and waited. As I drank another cup of coffee, my thoughts were occupied with three questions. First, what was going on with my wife? Who sent her the flowers? And would she be alone in the room tonight? I realized later that I had assumed as if she was alone at this time. Second, what happened to this strange interview? These women knew more about me than they should have. And what was their connection to my neighbor Esmeralda? And finally, my disturbing dreams were becoming too vivid and restless. I wasn't inclined to believe that dreams had any material significance, but why was I dreaming the same thing over and over again? I watched the elevators and pondered these questions, coming to nothing. A few minutes before seven, my wife entered the lobby from the elevator. She was dressed for an evening out. I recognized the dress. It was short, tight, and black. It had a deep neckline. She wore it to dinner on our fourth anniversary. It marked the return of my happy and loving wife from the depths of postpartum depression. Our fourth anniversary was an evening I have long remembered. I missed that dress, but it never showed up again. In fact, I didn't expect it to show up. It was an eye-catcher in backward Hollybrook. It was a dress that made a clear statement of debauchery. It was a pleasant memory, but only a memory, until she stepped off the elevator in Miami. She was wearing the highest heels and diamond earrings. But her most impressive accessory was an older man in a perfectly fitted white jacket. He was tall, with dark hair streaked with gray at the temples. His arm went around her waist and his hand went lower and lower. They were a stunning couple and had everyone in the hotel lobby in a tizzy. I was stunned. Before I could recover, they were already out the hotel doors, and as I was trying to catch up with them, I saw a limo taking them away. I returned to the lobby and found a chair at the far end. My doubts were now close to certainty. I realized I was breathing hard, like I had run a marathon, and just as tired. I wondered if I should leave, but something kept me in the lobby chair. My thoughts were gloomy. For no reason at all, I pulled out my cell phone and called my colleague in the Hollybrook community, Tom Lattimore. Hi, Ed, he answered. I hear congratulations are in order. What, what, stammered I. I was utterly bewildered. There are no secrets in the academy, old boy. The news that you're going to BC is already out. Oh, I said, realizing his meaning. It was just an interview. Well, not the way the Hollybrook administration is acting. They're in crisis mode trying to figure out how to keep you. You mean they care that much? Of course they care. There's a lot of recriminations about how low your compensation package is. I'd never done any teaching for money, and since Lucy started getting the big bucks, we hadn't needed anything. Vaguely, I realized that other people in the school in similar situations were being paid more. It also struck me that no one mentioned money during that long interview in Chestnut Hill. They talked about my daughters and how I would take care of them, but no one mentioned salary. Now that my marriage was falling apart, taking care of my children became my primary concern. It seemed like the interviewers, or two of them, knew my situation beforehand. I remember the way the women looked at Peter when he mentioned my wife. It was as if they already knew I was alone. Suddenly, I was desperate for information, which I turned to Tom for. I had taught U.S. history from the Civil War to the Eisenhower administration. Tom taught U.S. history from the first colonies to the Civil War. Well, my employment prospects are pretty dim, but I called to ask what you know about the witch trials in colonial Massachusetts. There was a brief pause, and then he said, Damn, it's weird that you're asking that. I know, but I feel like it might be important to me. Indeed. Hmm, I'd help if I could, but you know the program. 
It's Jamestown, the landing of the pilgrims at Plymouth, and these days a week of stories about the introduction of slavery. Then you skip through 150 years of darkness and violence and move on to the run-up to the revolution. People scalping each other and living in shit up to their navels is not what students pay money for. Well, if you don't know, do we know who does? A long pause followed while Tom pondered. You know, he finally said, I'd talk to Reverend Peabody. He cornered me at a seminar a few years ago and told me about Colonial Hollybrook. I thought I knew who he meant. He runs the Methodist Church at the corner of Main and Broadway in Hollybrook, I asked. Yes, he's a Methodist, but that church stands on the site of the first church in Hollybrook. We talked for probably another hour, exchanging what little we knew about the world before the American Revolution, but all too quickly returning to the gossip about me being spread at the community college. After wishing Tom a good night, I managed to grab a coffee before they closed up store in the hotel lobby a little after nine. There was nothing left for me to do but go over and over in my head what I had seen with my wife. Who was this man and why did he feel entitled to hold her so imperiously? There were no simple answers, but the doubts that were now at least partially confirmed turned into a series of doubts and questions. How long, when had it started, and the most important question of all, why? The phone rang. It was Lucy's night call. Hello, my love. How did your interview go? She asked nonchalantly. There was no hint in her voice or mannerisms that she was seeing another man. Not a sound could be heard in the background. She had learned her lesson from the previous night and called from a place that didn't give away her game. I was stunned. I hadn't counted on her calling, but I should have. It was a well-planned lie. The interview, I stammered out, She's walking with another man and casually asks about my interview. Nothing bad happened? She asks, clearly concerned. Something bad has happened. My life had fallen apart, but it had nothing to do with my teaching job. I needed to pull myself together or I would give away my game. The interview went well, but it was weird. In fact, it was very strange, but successful. What does that mean? She asked, already calmer, but still concerned. I don't know. It seemed to me that it was more than just a job interview. But at any rate, I've been invited to the second round. Another interview? Yes, the first interview is just a screening to see who they don't want. The next interview is more serious, I told her. So that's good then? She asked. I guess it depends on your point of view. Everyone in the Hollybrook community is just talking about my possible departure. I talked to Tom Lattimore today, and he knew all about the interview. Well, they're just jealous, she hummed. Have you looked around the school? Is it a good one? Oh, I've looked around. It's amazing what you can see if you look closely. But I don't think she's nice. Oh, you're just afraid of change. That's your New England pessimism, she scolded. Not all changes are good. They can damage a relationship, even destroy a marriage. We'll get through it, she argued. Look how well my return to work went. I know you were scared at first, but our marriage has gotten better. Really? You go away every month? You're in Florida now. Yes, but I always come back more loving and ready to be a good wife. We don't need to be physically together 365 days a year. But we do need to be together when we are together. Loving, wanting, and needing each other, she asserted. I didn't say anything back. When I fell silent, Lucy took over. Well, we both need to say good night to each other. You get a good night's sleep and be ready for your interview tomorrow, she said. She mistakenly assumed that the second interview would be the next day. This made sense since I was planning a three-day trip. I didn't bother to inform her of the mistake. Good night, my love, she said. I didn't say anything back, just hung up. I waited. They didn't come back until after midnight. The lobby was empty by then. They walked in, laughing and clearly high. They weren't drunk, but she was all over him. They didn't notice me. They only looked at each other. They kissed as they entered the elevator. When the elevator door closed, I looked to see which floor they stopped on, hers or his. The elevator stopped on the second and immediately went back down. They don't have two rooms, you idiot. They're together. The realization crushed the last vestiges of my ego. This wasn't a chance encounter. He was her lover and I was what? An idiot husband. 
I turned and looked around. It seemed someone else had spoken those last words. I walked up the stairs to the second floor. From the second floor landing, I watched the third room on the right. I opened the door to look outside. There were few people walking down the hallway. It was late in the day. I waited. I gave them time to go about their business. Patience was my virtue now. It was one o'clock, then half past two. I went out into the corridor. At the third door on the right, I stopped. I pulled out my cell phone. I called her. I thought I heard it ring from inside, but that could only have been in my imagination. The phone rang and her answering machine picked up. Pick up, Lucy, I demanded. I called back. She picked up immediately. She was panting, and I could hear the fear in her voice. Ed, what's wrong? I called to ask if you liked my flowers. Flowers, she paused. Oh, you sent flowers. You didn't tell me before. There was no card. Not as lush as his, I'm told. Open the door so I can see. I'm in the hallway. There was a slight creak, but the door remained closed. Open the damn door, Lucinda. Your husband, the one you say you love, is outside your room, in the hallway. There was a rustle inside. She opened the door. She was wearing a hotel robe. I pushed the door all the way open. She fell on her back. The rooms are small. There was nowhere to hide, but it didn't bother him. He sat upright on the bed. He showed no fear or embarrassment, only some irritation that his evening with my wife had been interrupted. There could be no doubt about it. I mentally ticked off that doubt and went on my way. As I turned to leave, Lucy found her voice. Please, Edward, don't go. I ignored her. She followed me down the hall, still pleading. Please, let's talk. I know I hurt you, but please try to understand. I pressed the button and an elevator appeared. I stepped into it and she headed out following. Then she realized she was wearing a robe over her silk teddy and stopped. As the elevator doors closed, she pleaded, Please wait! Edward, please don't go. I let the elevator take me to the lobby and returned to my room on the sixth floor. My bag was still packed. I picked it up and headed to the airport. I had no hope of getting on a plane this night, but I had to try. When I walked up to the reservation desk to change my flight, the flight attendant smiled and said, You're out of luck. The plane lands in an hour and there are still seats available. I would be back in Boston before breakfast, but not without penalty. Sleep was as vivid as ever. When I reached the meadow, the girl told me the others were dead. I felt the sharp pain of realizing my loss again. But my children were safe with the black-robed priest. It was there, deep in the northern forests where the priest lived with the natives, that I was located. I realized that I would have to act quickly if I wanted to save the girl. Fear crept up my back as I crossed the small bridge and swung open the door of my mother's cabin, my home where I lived with my mother, wife, and children. My wife and mother had been killed and they had come for the girl. I had to hide the girl. I knew what I had to do. I walked over to a fireplace with strange symbols carved into huge black stones, a circle representing a snake consuming itself, a baby enclosed in the circle and two wings on either side of it. I stepped toward the fireplace and pressed myself against the back wall. It shifted enough for a man to fit through it. I took one last look at her raven black hair and fiery green eyes. Now come through, I commanded. I'll push back the stone when you come in. What about you? It doesn't matter. I am with God, sanctified. Now come in. I pushed back the stone and started a fire. Our pursuers were kicking in the door. Only blood, someone else must die. When they came, they were wild with fear. They reeked of hell, but when they grabbed me, I felt God lift me up. Hey, you need to wake up. It was the passenger sitting next to me. The plane was still dark, but the cabin lights were on, and we were rolling to a stop on the runway. I don't know what you drank last night, but I'd avoid it in the future. Losing consciousness is one thing, but nightmares on top of that are quite another, he pondered. I hope I didn't disturb you, I said. No, but I'd have some coffee if I were you. The Reverend. Alex Peabody invited me to lunch at the parish house. I called him first thing upon my return to Hollybrook. When I got off the plane and turned on my phone, he was bursting with messages. I blocked Lucy at the airport before landing. By then, she had managed to send a dozen messages, which I refused to read. 
After she was blocked, she connected first her sister and then her mother. Both begged me to talk to Lucy. My mother-in-law asked for forgiveness, and not just for her daughter. I wondered what I should forgive her for. Before I could talk to them, however, I felt I had to deal with this dream. It had haunted me in my dreams, and now it was crossing the threshold from nightmare to reality. The Reverend readily agreed to talk to me and offered to have lunch at the parish house. He lived and worked in a modern house built at the back of the church grounds. The building itself, known locally as the New Methodist Church, dates from 1790 and was built over the foundations of the old church dating from 1670. The original congregation of the church were Protestant schismatics from the Church of England. We now call them Puritans. The Reverend greeted me warmly and treated me to a lunch of Hollybrook turkey sandwiches. They consist of turkey, Swiss cheese, roast turkey dressing, and cranberry mayonnaise and are served on a hard bun. Some versions of this sandwich can be found throughout New England, but the hard roll belongs to Hollybrook. As we ate, Reverend, Peabody spoke to me at length about the abolitionist movement in Hollybrook and our contribution to Union troops during the Civil War. I let him talk, building rapport and, I hoped, gaining his trust. When we finished our meal, I broached the topic that had brought me in. I'm actually looking for information on the witch trials of the late 17th century, I began. The witch trials were held in Salem. There were no witches in Hollybrook, he informed me. So there are no witches here, I inquired. I didn't say that, but there were no trials. Accused witches were not given that opportunity. I'm afraid Hollybrook was a very backward and violent community in those days. What do you know about those accused? Very little, he said, pausing. There's an old story about five witches who were caught and a sixth witch who escaped. You see, the story goes that there were six witches in the coven. They hanged five of them and burned their bodies, but the sixth somehow escaped and has been seeking revenge ever since. The reverend laughed, then added, That story was told in the olden days on Halloween to scare the children. These days they have Michael Mayer and Freddy Krueger. Any idea why some people were suspected of being witches? I've been asking myself that, he said, mulling over the answer. The few records that have come down to us from that time speak of bad luck. Unexpected bad luck. All the cows withered all at once. Strange diseases that seem to befall some and not others. After all, it could be written off as superstition. How would I check to see if my ancestors were related to the accused witches? Come on, I'll show you. He led me into a large room with walls lined with old books. Church records from 1670 to the present day, he informed me, but with a twinkle in his eye. Not the real ones, of course. The records up to 2,000 have been taken to Harvard. They're all copies, he said, waving his hand toward the walls filled with books. Almost all of the church's current income comes from genealogical research. People today want to know where they come from and it's truly amazing that many of them can trace their roots back to the first settlers of New England. I didn't know that. Yes, but it's not that many emigrated. A few dissenters did leave England, but they took the admonition to be fruitful and multiply very seriously. I fear, however, that monogamy among them was more of an ideal than a reality. Things change the further away you go, I muttered. What was it? he inquired. I was just a little shocked by your notes. But tell me, what are computers for? I asked, pointing to a long table with several workstations. Well, students from Harvard are helping me compile a database. We've compiled it up to about 1740. Can we find my namesake, Edward Goodson? We can try, he said, sitting down in front of the screen. He typed in the name and after a few minutes found nothing. No Goodson. Oh, I said, disappointed. But you have to be persistent and a little creative, he told me. Names change over time. Your name is Good Son now. That doesn't sound at all like Eric's son or John's son. See, a compound name that distinguishes father from son. He typed again, then smiled. So, Edward Hood, born March 17, 1680, died March 22, 1705. Suddenly, he stopped and pushed back his chair. Oh, my God, he wheezed. This is the same Edward Hood. Without further explanation, he stood up and walked over to the closet. 
Opening a drawer, he began going through a stack of thin papers until he found what he was looking for. It was a rectangular piece of onion-skinned paper, probably 22 inches by 17. He placed it carefully on the table. They collect these, he said. Grave inscriptions. We stopped that practice in the churchyard. With unrestricted use, the stone wears out. But we can't protect all the headstones in the neighborhood. And this one is immensely popular because of the unusual image and promise. He spread the inscription on the stone, and on it, in addition to the name and dates of birth and death, was the symbol of a snake eating its tail. The baby in the fetal position was barely visible, and the wings on either side were rubbed. But it was unmistakably the same symbol as on the black stone of the fireplace. We suppose the wings may symbolize an angel, suggested Reverend Peabody. No, I said. Take a closer look. They're the wings of a bird. Hair as dark as a raven's wing, I thought. Yes, that's possible, he agreed. Can you take me to this grave, Reverend? It's a short walk, as it's not in the churchyard. You'll have to go back to the woods off Osborne Road. Of course, I thought. Where else would she put it? We drove the cars down the county road until we were west of Osborne Road. Then we had to walk into the woods, which was made even more difficult by the snow that still lay deep in the forest. By the time we reached the grave, it could no longer be mistaken for a grave. The snow had been shoveled off of it. The area around it was marked by five small stone pyramids. I did not immediately realize that they formed a pentagram. Instinctively, I knew that the pyramids covered the bones of witches who had been hanged and their bodies burned. I saw what she had written on the bottom of the tombstone. I'm waiting for you. And that's when I realized everything. I knelt down and bowed my head. I saw that I had shocked a reverend who had come on a purely genealogical mission. The intervention of faith was unexpected and awkward. He was a man of faith who followed the example of his savior and sacrificed himself for another, I explained to the dumbfounded minister. He lost everything he loved and had only his life left but he gave it up for another. He may not have been a man in your sense of the word, but he was a true Christian. I thanked a rather embarrassed reverend, Alex Peabody, for his help and removed myself from him. I think I'll walk from here, I said. If I go around this hill and across the path, I'll end up at home. I walked from the burial place of Edward Hood and his family. My ancestor's self-sacrifice had a profound effect on me. My dreams had brought me closer to his spirit, and I felt both his fear and his faith. Now I sought the safety of my own home and perhaps a few hours of restful sleep. I felt physically and spiritually exhausted. But that didn't happen, my wife returned. We need to talk things over. She began an explanation that sounded and had the structure of a prepared presentation. Edward, I know I have hurt you deeply and caused you unforgivable pain. But please give me a chance to explain my actions before you take any irreversible steps. Give me a chance to earn your forgiveness. She paused, waiting for some sign from me that it was okay to continue. I nodded in agreement and she began. Three years ago, I was in a terrible position. As you know, after the birth of our twins, I suffered from postpartum depression. Giving birth to the twins didn't help. The physical and mental stresses of dealing with two babies were beyond me. Fortunately, I had a caring and understanding husband. She paused to smile and nod at me. As befits a presentation, she got off to a great start. She's a great businesswoman and had clearly thought through how to present her actions. I started working full-time when the twins reached their dreaded age. It was one of two things, either go crazy. She was right. She barely survived our daughter's infancy. At two years old, the girls were showing a propensity for antics that required my constant attention. I was even glad Lucy had gone back to work so I could focus on the girls without having to worry about my wife's needs. As you may remember, she continued, I attended a professional development program in Newport, Rhode Island. You didn't go because Patty came down with an ear infection and it looked like Sarah might have gotten the same thing. I had to get continuing education credits for my financial planner certification. I remembered that certification wasn't a requirement for those in Lucy's position, but it was nice to have it. That week, our Patty got sick. The girls had just started kindergarten and there was some kind of bug. Patty was prone to ear infections, and what one twin got sick would soon spread to the other. Accompanying his wife to her three-day course at a luxury resort was out of the question. 
I went alone and ended up next to Carl. He was the very real definition of a tall, dark, and handsome man. He immediately started flirting with me. At first, I tried not to respond. There was a slight pause in her monologue, and I could see her mentally reliving the moment. So, she continued, that night a group of us went out drinking together. I found myself paired up with Carl. He kept dropping compliments and using all his charm. Finally, I raised my hand and said, Look, I'm married. He just smiled, raised his hand and said, Me too. Turns out he has a wife and two boys, but he is still in relationships with other people. I told him I didn't like that kind of freedom, and no matter how tempted I was, it wasn't going to happen, and it didn't, at least not then. She paused to make sure I was listening and not moving away from her. I think at this point she was expecting some sort of protest from me. Not seeing it, she continued. When I got home, I was irritable and even more depressed and unhappy. It was clear to me that going back to work alone was not going to help me solve the problem. You may recall that I was seeing a therapist at the time. Margaret Salton, I interjected. I remembered Maggie. We'd had a few sessions when we'd both met with her, but she had made it clear that she was Lucy's therapist. I only remembered the last session clearly because I thought something was wrong, and in the entire 50-minute session, she never once looked me in the eye. I told Margaret about Carl. She asked why I didn't give in to him. Because I'm married and I love my husband. I almost shouted at her. And yet you were tempted. Why? She asked. It took me a few moments, but I admitted it was because Carl was exciting. The thought of a new romance in my boring life was almost irresistible. I resisted but she made me admit that it was very close, and I wasn't sure I could do it again. Monogamy can be a difficult path for some. It doesn't make you a bad person or indicate a lack of love for your husband, she said. Lucy paused and looked at me. Can you understand, Ed? Go on, I nodded. I wanted to tell her to get to the point already, but I restrained myself. Do you remember Peggy Winthrop? she asked. The name seems familiar, but I can't remember it. You met her several times at United Way fundraisers in Medford. Periodically, Lucy dragged me to the charity events she was obligated to attend for her business. Peggy owns a chain of bridal stores. She was one of my first clients when I went back to work after the twins were born. She is in her 50s and has been divorced for over a decade. One day after meeting Carl, I invited her to lunch. We got a talking mostly about our children. She said that the divorce had hurt the kids and that the whole thing was such a stupid waste of time, she told me. I asked her if she felt that way why she got divorced. Because I was a moralist, a fool who was bored with marriage. Fred Winthrop was a fine man. Still a fine man, she corrected. But when he turned 40, he developed a beer belly and a habit of falling asleep in front of the TV in the evenings. I still loved him, but the romance was gone. She paused and what she said next stunned me. I should have left my husband and had a lover, she said with a sigh. At first I didn't know what to answer, and then I asked, But what would have happened if your husband had found out? To this she smiled and replied, Nothing. I realized that her analysis was basically correct. As she told me, the husband rarely discovers infidelity, and if he does, 90% of the time the couple stays together. Only women end a good marriage for romantic reasons. Men, on the other hand, tend to hang on to what they have. They may not like what happened, but they tend to stay put. Peggy claimed she had made a terrible mistake. She destroyed her family because she wanted a little romance. I'm afraid talking to Peggy became an excuse for me. I called Carl and made dinner arrangements. Our relationship only lasted three months, but it lifted my spirits. We, meaning you and I, were happy again. Our sex life was back to the level it had been before the pregnancy, and then more and more. I was determined to make you happy. As happy as I was. There were others after Carl, but nothing serious or lasting. Then there was Frank, the man in my room. She paused, but not for effect. I could see her struggling. She hesitated to continue, but she needed to finish the script. It's different with Frank. We're in love. Neither of us planned the depth of our relationship. He and his wife Susan are polyamorous. She is well aware of my relationship with her husband and has made an effort to befriend me. It's their loving and fully committed relationship that just has other people in it. 
Just because I love Frank doesn't mean I love you any less, or that it would occur to me to leave you for him. He wouldn't leave his wife for me. That's not the nature of our relationship. We are not spouses, we are lovers. I want to emphasize that Frank and Susan have done nothing wrong. All the wrongdoing is on my part. I cheated. It was a terrible act, but I did it. From the beginning, Frank begged me to tell you about him. Asked for understanding and permission. I wanted to tell you with all my heart, but I didn't because I was afraid of hurting you and terrified that I might ruin our marriage. I was a coward, and you were hurt as a result. Thankfully, I realized she was wrapping up, but she did so with a swagger. She walked right up to me, leaned over to where I was sitting, and looking me straight in the eye said, I know I have no right to your forgiveness, but please forgive me. She finished the sentence by wrapping her arms around my neck and pressing her damp cheek against mine. I stood up, taking her by the shoulders and pushing her back at arm's length. Looking directly into her warm brown eyes, I said, Lucinda, listen carefully. I forgive you for everything. Your lies, your stinginess, and your infidelity. After visiting Edward Hood's grave, I cannot do otherwise. My words were met with confusion and disbelief. She got what she asked for, but was puzzled by the ease of it. I let her go and started to walk away. Where are you going? She asked. I'm going through Weaver's Lane. The little brook is gone, replaced by a storm drain, and with it a rough bridge. The house was burned to the ground, but you can't mistake the fireplace. You can't leave now. Why should you leave? She demanded. Because it's time to meet the witch. As I crossed the street that I now knew was Weaver's Lane, I felt the wind pick up. The sun was setting behind the hills in the west, and it felt like a storm was coming. Neither the bell nor Esmeralda's determined knock on the door elicited any response, but the door seemed to open by itself. Stepping inside, lit only by the last rays of daylight, I could not match the interior to my dreams. This made sense, as I was sure the original structure had been destroyed, except for the large stone fireplace. I walked over to the fireplace. I pushed the back wall, but nothing happened. I changed position and tried again. I pushed harder and the back wall moved. It moved an inch or two, but no more. Three hundred years is too long a gap between discoveries, I'm afraid, the voice said. I turned and there she stood. She was older, but not old. A mature woman and no longer a girl. Her hair was as black as a raven's wing. Her green eyes burned with an unearthly light. She seemed even smaller than in my dreams, but she was incredibly beautiful. We stood looking at each other. Two beings bound by an act of absolute selflessness committed some 300 years ago. Finally, she spoke, and her green eyes seemed to soften and dim. I've been waiting, she whispered. I didn't know what else to do. She turned away as if unable to look at me. Do I really look that much alike? I asked. She turned to me again and shook her head. Similar, but not the same. But his soul is your soul. I knew you would come back. You couldn't stay away forever. And how long would you have waited? As long as it took. Tell me about him, I asked. She walked over to me, wrapped her arms around my waist and pressed her face against my chest. Then she spoke. We came from the old world with the pilgrims. We thought we had escaped persecution, burning, drowning, and torture. And then it all began again in the new land. You led us away from the coast and deep into the forest. You built a shelter behind the hearth. We lived here in safety, but there were more and more people. Then hard times came. Hard times came, I prompted, mentally visualizing it. The harvest failed. The game left the northern forests and went south. The cold weather intensified. And then I began to transform, she told me. I reached puberty. My blonde hair darkened and my eyes changed color, she said, looking into my eyes. I didn't know how to hide the change. I was too young. It's not your fault, I assured her. Some are more powerful than others. You have to have time to learn to deal with it. She nodded and continued. You knew the French priest. He was one of us. He lived in the Green Mountains with the natives. You took the children to him. We were planning to flee north when you returned. Follow a false trail. I knew it now. What happened? Measles. 
You barely had time to leave before it started spreading. Like a deadly angel striking them. It didn't touch us. It couldn't. It was the last straw. They struck before the rest of us could hide. I was far away in the woods trying to avoid the humans. They hanged the others and burned their bodies. Then they came looking for me. But I found you first, I said, smiling at her. Oh, Edward, they tore you to pieces. They destroyed the cottage looking for me. And then the storm came. I heard it. Nothing for a moment, and then a great roar, as if the heavens were angry. With the cottage gone, they had nowhere to hide. The strong wind tore the trees out of the ground and forced the men to flee. And you buried me after that? asked I. Yes, and I waited to repay you. People were afraid to come here after the storm, and many did not survive another disease that came upon them. It wasn't my fault. It just happened. I rebuilt the cottage and waited for you to come back. I pulled her against me and felt her shiver with grief and relief that her torment was finally over. She was the essay witch, and Esmeralda was her disguise. She could change her appearance. For her, it was like putting on a cloak. I don't know how long we stood in front of the huge stone hearth. Night had already descended completely. Let's go to my place, I said at last. Away from these sad memories. As we walked down the path, she asked me, How can I repay your sacrifice? Dear Essa, it was no bargain. Edward Good made a sacrifice and joined as God. I am but an echo of the past. But I need you, she pleaded. I've been watching you and helping you. I can only do little things. I can make homeboys welcome. Send a cat to watch over you. But everything I could do, I did so that one day we'd be together again. I sighed and said, I have a wife and children. An unfaithful wife and a pair of witch daughters. I don't believe you. My daughters are not witches. But even after saying that, I realized she was telling the truth. The legacy of my ancestors. A gift that is a curse. What will you do, Edward, when your precious girls reach the age when their beautiful blonde curls turn raven black and their pale blue eyes light up an unearthly green color? I can handle it, I said as I reached my house. And yet I knew things had to change. The twins had to come first. When we got to the front door, I.S.'s stepped back. There are people in there. Your wife, her lover, another woman, and another man, she told me. I'll go in first and make them leave, I assured her. No, we'll go in together. Let me disguise myself. As I watched, she seemed to transform from witch to ordinary mortal. A dark-haired woman with green eyes and a charming smile, but the supernatural being was hidden beneath a veil. Inside, it became clear that my wife had sent for reinforcements. Her lover Frank had arrived and brought his wife and another man with him. They sat casually in the living room drinking wine. No doubt they were discussing how to convince me to accept some new status quo. They weren't counting on Essa. She immediately walked in and introduced herself. Hi, I'm Essa. My grandmother lives across the street. You must be Lucy, Essie said, extending her hand. I could tell from my wife's eyes that the sudden appearance of an attractive young woman had disrupted her plans. Lucy hesitated, but then took Essie's offered hand and tried to smile. Frank stepped in to try to help her. It's nice to meet you. I'm Frank. This is my wife Sheila and our close friend Oscar, he said, and then turned to me and held out his hand. I apologize for not introducing myself last night, but the situation was awkward. Sheila was a short woman with blonde hair. I figured she was in her early 40s, probably a year or two younger than her husband. Oscar was a tall young man, no older than 25, his skin the color of coffee. Oscar was blatantly peeking at Essa. I let Frank's hand hang there until he lowered it. I wasn't about to welcome him into my home. At this point, my wife seemed to find her speech. I didn't know Esmeralda had a granddaughter or children, Lucy demanded. My wife was both hostile and suspicious. We live in western Massachusetts, and recently I was visiting friends in Chestnut Hill. Oh, is that near Boston College by any chance? My wife accused, her eyes narrowing. Actually, not too far away. I took this opportunity to look for a house for Ed, the girls, and me. He's probably going to be hired for a teaching position at BC, and we want to leave Hollybrook and its bad memories behind us. 
I could tell from her words that Essa was maneuvering behind the scenes. My dreams, a new job, and the discovery of my wife's infidelity. There were no unexplained miracles. Visions of the past disguised as dreams, nagging doubts, a lost bag, a job opening, a witch doctor interview, and perfect timing for a trip to Miami and back. Just luck, you'll say? But was it luck or bad luck? For 300 years before that, the people of Hollybrook had been unlucky. Is it our fault? My wife spoke. Or rather, she yelled. Listen, you bitch. I don't know who you think you are, but nobody's going to take my husband and kids away from me. No one's taking them away. You threw them away yourself. I waited a long time for my man. But I gave you every opportunity and all you did was cheat. As for Sarah and Patty, I'll let them choose. But you already know where their hearts lie. Don't you, bitch! At that moment, Frank tried to get between the two women who seemed about to pounce on each other. But he tripped and fell, hitting the end table. Blood was pouring from the wound on his head. There was a lot of blood. Lucy and Sheila rushed to his aid. Oscar had lost consciousness. Essa pulled out her cell phone and called for help. Then she whispered in my ear, I think my work here is done. She pulled me out of the house and once outside I asked, Where to now? I think we should spend a few days with Alice Parker while we look for a house. But we need to stop and pick up the twins on the way. They miss their daddy. Alice won't mind? I asked. Oh no. She's looking forward to seeing Sarah and Patricia. I hugged her, just as I had Edward years ago. We were on our way to a new life, free, I hoped, from the past. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, so subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.